Remember that when switching loops occur, that loop can continue forever. Well, how do we stop that? Well, I'm Ronnie Wong and I'm here to show you what the pros know. All right, so we're gonna talk about spanning tree protocol. It is the protocol that we use to prevent switching loops from happening. Remember that if we have a network that has redundant links, especially with switches, we will end up with a switching loop. If we take a look at this diagram right here, if I'm trying to communicate from PC1 all the way over to PC3, well, notice that there's two possible paths, right? I can go from switch one, all the way over to switch three to hit PC3, or the traffic can actually go over to switch two to switch three and then to PC3. Well, that's where we can actually have a loop occur. Now, the same thing can happen if a broadcast goes out, right? From switch one, if PC1 sends out a broadcast, it's gonna go across both of those switches. Both of those switches are also gonna forward it out every other port except for the one it came in on. And that means it's gonna go across this way. Those two will do the same thing and it will come back in and will continue around forever. Spanning tree protocol does this by simply going ahead and blocking one of the ports that are actually available for us. But we have to ask like, how in the world does that end up working? And that's kind of the key behind this, right? The great thing is most of the switches that you work with today automatically have this feature turned on, but why do we actually need to know about it? Well, if you're actually studying for a certification exam, it's a key element and actually understanding what happens is also key too. So for example, when you first turn on a switch, like a Cisco switch, Remember that as you plug something in, it doesn't go ahead and start forwarding right away by default. It might make you wait between 30 to 50 seconds before it actually comes up and does what it needs to. The reason it's doing that is because it's expecting possibly to be connected to another switch. And the reason why it's doing that is because it's running what we'll call spanning tree protocol. So it makes it wait and actually does something. So what's going on in that time is what we're gonna be talking about here and how it actually begins to help us. So when something like this occurs and we have multiple switches, now we'll go on. They're sending across what we call, well, different BPDUs, bridge protocol data units. And that is beginning the election of one of these three switches to be what we call the king of that switching network. Now, why do we actually call it king? Well, there are a couple of different things here. First is king because those ports on that switch will never get blocked in this type of topology. So when it's connected to another switch, it's always gonna actually say, hey, I'm not gonna be one of those ports that's gonna get blocked. Secondly, it's also king because all the other devices before it can actually send anywhere else on the network, it has to ensure that the traffic somehow goes through that switch. So all the traffic goes through the king as well. So in this particular topology, we're gonna to try and keep it as non-technical as possible so that we understand it. But if you do want to find out more about it, make sure you go into the IT Pro TV library and check out our CCNA course right there. And we'll go into it in much more depth and detail. So. What actually happens here for a switch to become king? Well, two things are decided, right? So right at the beginning, in terms of spanning tree protocol, every switch ends up with a protocol number. So all three of these switches here will end up with a protocol number by default of 32768, okay? So 32768. Here. Now, also on these switches, there's a base MAC address that will also happen to. So each one of these switches has a base MAC address. Now I'm gonna make these up, so I'm gonna simplify it. So this one will be all twos, and I'm just gonna represent it by four twos here. This one will be all ones, and this one will be all threes. Okay, now you're starting to notice that there's probably like you're saying, hey, why did your handwriting get so badly? Because I didn't draw the original diagram, okay? Now, once we have this, okay, between those switches, they'll start exchanging this information and they'll determine who's gonna be king by what is what they call the lowest bridge ID. And that's a combination of the, pro, of the priority number and the MAC address. So they actually decide which one's gonna be the lowest. And for us in this instance, that's gonna be switch number one. So this one will become the king. Now, when it becomes the king, remember what we said, all data then We'll go ahead and go through them. Now the rest of them will kind of you know work itself out, but they'll all start announcing switch number one to king here. So now that means each of these ports will go ahead and begin to forward traffic. Okay, so I've marked it so that it actually forwards traffic here. Now from that point, that's what the king does. Now, what about these other two switches here? Okay, the other two switches 
to help us out in the spanning tree protocol. They'll go ahead and they're now called what we call non-root bridges at this point. So a little bit of terminology there, but they're essentially not the king, okay? So neither one of those two are the king. So they'll have to determine their shortest path back to, or the least cost path back to the king or back to the root. So for switch number two, we can easily see that, but on a real topology, it may not be able to actually be that easily spotted for us as well, okay? So those two will actually end up in forwarding state as well. So that makes it easy. We can continue to actually go ahead and say, hey, traffic can be forwarded in here. But we have a loop. We can still forward across this way to get to PC3, or we're on PC3, we can actually forward it across this way to get to PC1. So it is between switch two and switch three that we now have to go, hey, one of those two ports is gonna be blocking, okay? So that's what will end up happening there. Now, how do we determine which one of those two ports is gonna be blocking? Well, the protocol number is the same. We're not actually gonna take a look at the MAC address yet because that's not gonna work, but we now have to talk about the idea of the cost back to the root bridge. So we'll make it easy. Now, there's actually specific costs we're not getting in that. But let's say that this cost here is 10, this one here is 12, and this one here is 14. So we'll do it that way. Now, the way that switch one will go ahead and try and do it, or switch two, excuse me, switch two will do it, is that it will go across here and goes, hey, there's a cost of 14. And then when it comes across switch three to go down to the root bridge again, there's 12, so 14 and 12 there, that's gonna be 26. Makes sense. Switch three will go across to switch number two, and then come down across this link to switch one, and then it will go 14 and 10, that's 24, that is the least cost. So this port will end up forwarding. And it also means this port will end up blocking, okay? Now, once we have that down and it actually goes ahead and begins blocking, that means the rest of the network will go ahead and use this, but we'll actually have prevented loop. Let's talk about the original idea again. PC1 going ahead and sending on to PC3. Notice now that switch number one, it shouldn't go across to switch number two again to go across to switch number three. If it does, it's gonna be blocked right here. PC1 going across switch number one, coming up to switch three, is forwarding port, it gets directly to PC3. Now, do we have full connectivity throughout our entire network? Well, we have to verify it by switch number two as well. So we have another computer over here and it needs to go ahead and send across as well. Well, do we have a path to get through? Notice here that switch number two, PC2 here, let's call it PC2, it can go across switch number two. It's gonna get blocked here, but it has this one single path here going through switch one and switch three to be able to gain access to PC3. So nobody is blocked even though we blocked a port on this particular network. So that's the foundation and beginning of understanding how spanning tree protocol works. If you're looking for more technical detail, like I said, make sure you do check out our course inside of the IT Pro TV library. Well, I'm Ronnie Wong, and that is what the pros know.